welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in this episode I have the man, the myth, the legend, Alberto Nunez and I say this a lot but I think this is quite a unique episode of the podcast. I talked to Berto who was my coach this year uh, about my contest prep, my failed contest prep. Uh, I started working with Berto in January 2018 and we set our sights on getting on stage September 2018 and it got to April and unfortunately I had to pull the pin. So we're going to talk about why that happens, uh, how a coach can handle their athletes you know, in cases when they do need to pull the pin and how athletes can set themselves up to make sure that uh, they put themselves in the best position possible to make a successful run at the stage and also how to deal with uh, the post comp blues even though they don't actually compete. So I'm really sure many of you competitors will get a lot out of this, as will coaches. Uh, It's it's really insightful. Berto is full of wisdom and knowledge. So make sure you like the episode if you do enjoy it. Subscribe to the channel and enjoy. All right. There we go. Nicotine nicotine patch in, man. Um, It's in my jam of late, dude. Um, And it's it's purely nicotine, too. It's like, so it's it's, in in itself, it's pretty benign. but it gets you flown up here. It's like as good as utopian, in my opinion. So <laughs> easy, bro. <laughs> All right, welcome. I'm gonna keep that in. I'm gonna keep that in. Welcome, welcome back, guys, <laughs> to the JPS podcast. And it's an absolute privilege to have the man himself, Alberto Nunes. Welcome, Nunes. Hey, what's up? So now they know this isn't a drug-free podcast. But hey, hey, someone here took. I know you took coffee. That's what you have right there, homie. It is, man. It is. It's decaf, nah. <laughs> not, not with two kids in this time of the morning. <laughs> That's full of <straight laughs> shit. <laughs> no, but guys, today I wanted to have a chat with Alberto. So some of you may know uh, that I attempted to get on stage this year, 2018, and Berto was the man in my corner helping me uh, lay out the plan and obviously execute that. But unfortunately, things didn't go to plan this year. Uh, and we're going to talk about that today because I think it's one of those topics that uh, athletes and coaches don't really talk about enough because you know, we always see the success stories on social media. We always hear athletes talking about uh, the seasons where everything went well and they absolutely you know, dominated their prep. Um, excuse me, Alfred. <laughs> Eden. Keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. There we go. <laughs> I'll be out soon, Eden. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to get real with things today and talk about something that's been plaguing me for a little while. I've wanted to, to speak a little bit more openly about it for quite some time, um, but just haven't really had a platform to do so, or I have had the platform, but I just didn't know how to go about it, and I thought it'd be a, a great discussion with Alberto, considering... Uh, yeah, he's very experienced in this arena. So, Berto, let's wind the clock back. December 2017, uh, when I first reached out to you and we began the process of setting up the contest prep, uh, you know, and the approach we took out of the gate. So, do you want to give the, the listeners, I guess, a bit of a background as to the prep, some of your, your thoughts around how we started, you know, my starting position, what your thoughts were, all those kind of things? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. So I guess first of all, man, like whenever you get a high profile prep, like it just it makes my mouth water, you know. So and I'd consider you like definitely like a high profile prep. Like people are going to be watching. Uh, they're going to keep be keeping track of your, track of your work. It's you know usually a, there's a good athlete there as well, and there's a lot of competitors that you know maybe they, they coach as well, and you know they're, they're decently they have a pretty good reputation, but they won't take those athletes on. They won't. Like I know a lot of them. They're like nope. Um, just because, yeah, you do, like, it's stressful. It's stressful to, um, you know, when you're prepping yourself, you, you're in charge of yourself, but then here you are prepping someone else and their stuff is out there. Um, hey, talk about pressure. We have spectators now, right? Um, so yeah, more spectators than we would have had at the show. Like when you think about it, like other people have been peeping into what we're doing. Um, so when I stop and think about it, it's like, oh wow, I can drive you insane. You know, that can definitely... Yeah. Uh, yeah, give you some nerves, but no, I was, I was super excited. I was, I was, I knew you were going to do the work. So I think that's why, that was where I found the comfort in that. It's like, you know what, this is a dude that just gets things done. Uh, we're on the same page for sure. 
um, you know, there isn't much need for buying there. You know, we we have, you know, we we understand the same stuff basically, right? We're from the same school. Um, so one thing we did that was unique is we got you in a good starting position, um, and that was because you are a little bit more lower body fat dominant than than most men, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, it turns out you're not as lower body fat dominant as I thought. You're more, you're a little bit more, like evenly distributed. But nevertheless, you know, you don't have the gut in the off season like I do. You know, um, so I'm like, you know what? Let's get you into a good starting position so that we have time, so that we can, you know, take the diet breaks when we need them. We can lose at a lose at a pace that uh, is going to allow us to conserve as much. You know, because you, in order to look like you lift at the end of a prep, <clears throat> you have to lift and especially with a more advanced bodybuilder, it's like, well, you're babysitting like some, yeah, some pretty advanced adaptations. And like you're trying to keep those in an environment that's not necessarily ideal, right? So um, so we set ourselves up so that we could, you know, only go so far. We didn't have to run a marathon and a half, basically. So our setup was great. I think we started in a great position. Um, and then... Um, so the starting point was great. And then we came out of the gates flying too. We're like, let's get some of this easy stuff out. Um, I knew you'd be able to handle it. And, and then from there we could kind of see how things are going and then work around the pace of your own body. But that was, that was the, that was the, the strategy coming out the gates. And I think that part was super well executed. I couldn't have asked for more there. Yeah. I think, um, I, I dropped down from it was something like eighty five to 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 the mid seventy nines in like eight weeks, and I think from January through to to April, like I started to in in that sixteen week period, I started to have what what resembled a few lines on my butt, and it, it was pretty mm-hmm. freaky. Like I had the full Christmas tree, um, and I was looking really good, and people were really questioning, um, you know, why are you doing this so early? You know, why are you looking like this now? Mm-hmm. You've mm-hmm. still got, um, you know, four or so months until you get to the stage because the goal was to get on stage uh, in September. And I guess, uh, yeah, for, for the listeners, do you want to explain why uh, it's so important to, to get ready early and why, you know, athletes should, you know, take a longer prep and potentially some of the, the drawbacks with a longer prep um, versus, you know, just, just going hard for that, you know, 16, 20 weeks uh, versus, you know, the, the almost nine-month prep that we set out to do? Um, well, I guess to, to <clears throat> kick things off, like, your situation was different because we weren't aiming for, like, you know, like late 1990s shredded. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we we wanted to reinvent the look, and I knew that's what you wanted, and I knew that you could handle it because, I mean, you know that on your end. People sign up for shredded, but are you really ready for that? You know, as you walk an athlete through, you find out, you know, and you want to make sure this isn't their last prep. Um, so with you, I was like, you know what, I'll push this dude as hard as he needs to be pushed. We're going to get everything off. And it's funny because, like, whatever that final look was, <clears throat> to get as shredded as we wanted to get shredded, yeah, like, a lot more. there's still, oh, there's still more. Like, people, until you see it, you're like, oh, until you see it in person, not even in pictures. You need to see this thing in person. And then you're like, oh. I get it now, you know, um, you talk to most, uh, high, high level, uh, professional natural bodybuilders, like they can caliper less on their butt than they can on their knuckles. Mm-hmm. Like that's what it gets to. And that's what we were aiming for. So people were impressed. It's like, hold up, we're not done yet. This is, this is just to set us up for that push so that we can maneuver how we want. Um, the biggest issue with like a long prep versus a slow prep, there's like a sweet spot. Like it could be so accelerated that it's like too taxing if it's, if it's too short, right? Like, that's taxing in itself. Duh, people know that. But it can also be too long to the point where it's the exact same thing. It's just like Chinese water torture, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but with you, I knew you could handle it. And I was going to buy as much time as we needed to get shredded and then not have a peak week, but have peak weeks. That was the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. And, yeah, this was something that I was totally down for and tried to explain to people because, yeah, like, like I said, a lot of people were, were pretty impressed, but I knew there was a lot more to go. Uh, but in April, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, there, there came a point where things were getting pretty tough on my end. I uh, had a lot of personal stuff going on. Um, you know, my partner was was getting pretty frustrated with just my 
lack of uh, functionality day to day. Um, and obviously, because I run two businesses and have two kids, uh, pretty much two of everything except two wives, um, it, it was getting tough. And I mentioned to you in April that you know, push was coming to shove and I, I needed to, to make a decision whether or not this was, was still worth it given um, you know, a lot of changes in my personal life and you know, things getting harder on that end. And do you think that as soon as an athlete starts to rethink their decision uh, that it, it's game over? For, for many athletes, or or is it common that you know some athletes are able to push through and you know turn things around? Because I know when I said that I was unsure whether I was going to continue, but I'd give it another month. Um, you know, I, I could tell that it was going to be a big ask for me to turn this thing around and then keep going. You know, like things were were going in the other direction. I had to turn the ship around but then keep tracking on for another four or five months. Did, did you think in your mind when I told you that I was rethinking it that uh, this this is over now or did you did you have faith? Well, just kind of how we ended up in that spot that we didn't expect where that was the reality of the situation. Um, it could change the other way too. Like it can go from like, oh, the coast has got clear all of a sudden. So I was like, you know what? Just how this is unexpected, you never know. We might be in a totally different place um, you know, a month from now, I've, I don't know, it's always been a fear of my own, like to start a prep and have it end mm. unexpected like that. Um, or, or yeah, to fail a prep basically, you know? Um, and I imagine it, it's going to happen at some point. It's probably going to be something similar where like, I know at some point, like, you know what, this is not working for a number of reasons. Let's, let's keep this under surveillance. Um, and I think it happens to a lot of athletes. It's just you don't hear about it. Like you, you know, like you mentioned, it's like we see those people on the stage, and you know, we're always judging. Like this guy looks good. He did his work. And then what's up with this dude here? There's way more, like I guess, horror stories, if you will. A lot of people were supposed to be there, and they didn't make it. Um, and I'd say like roughly, probably close to half, because I know a lot of people who have been trying to get on the stage for years, and they just have been, they haven't been able to to finish the race, basically. So. Um, it's common, I think, for people like you, it's just you're not used to that happening. Mm. That was part of the stress, you know? Whatever you need to do, you get done. Um, and in a way, like, your prep was like a treat for yourself, you know? Yes, it was going to help you with, you know, the business side of things, but it was it was your idea of fun. It was your one selfish thing that, you know, that uh, it was it was dad's treat, basically, right? Mm. Um, and he still myself for a few months, right? Um, so... I was pushing for it, man, and I thought I thought there was a very I thought it was very fifty fifty. But I knew you'd make the right decision because a lot of people get into that position and they don't they don't think that clearly. Like you know, it's not even an option almost. Right? Um, it ends up being force fed, but for us, it was a total decision where we took the time to look at everything and decide, okay, what is the best thing, like realistically, and we made that decision. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that was definitely something I, I didn't want the prep to become. I didn't want it to detract from everything else in my life. Um, it was meant to be a treat, and I'd planned for a number of years that 2018 was was going to be the right time. Um, you know, with with the business set up and you know having the family. You know, the kids were young; they couldn't see dad on the scales. You know, starving himself you know, moping around, um, you know, in sloth mode because he's got no energy. I didn't want my kids to be old enough to comprehend that. Um, so, the, so the stars did align in that sense, but then uh, there were a few pieces of the puzzle that just, you know, got taken away as we went through. Um, but yeah, that was, it was a tough decision. And I guess what what are the signs and the things that you, you look for when uh, a prep is on the verge of going south or the warning signs, the red flags, uh, what do you look for in a prep that signifies perhaps it's time to call it quits? Um, and when, when, when would you advise someone to um, pull out of a prep? See, with you, it wasn't the typical symptoms because usually it's compliance. Like when that starts to become an issue, you know, that's usually when it, you know, because someone who's very excited, you know how it is. Like if anything, I, I, I kind of urge them to conserve energy early on, you know? It's like, you know, this is going to be long and dragged out. At some point, we will be four, six weeks out, and you'll feel trapped almost. Like, there's no room for error. 
Um, so with you, that was not the issue. That's usually the first thing I see is if someone is, um, yeah, getting to the point where they have a hard time meeting the bare minimum for whatever phase we're in. Um, but that was never really the case. It was just more so, yeah, you, you had a firm understanding of everything that was going around you and, and how that was going to take its own, how that was a distraction, how this wasn't the best environment to, you know, if you would have gone through and done everything, um, a lot of things wouldn't have gone done right, possibly, like the prep itself, right? Um, but, so yeah, with you, like, it, was, it wasn't the usual, because usually it's compliance. Um, I'd say after that is uh, probably a disturbance in mood that's like far exceeds like the usual, um, you know, because that, that is one of the symptoms of, you know, of, of, um, of going on a, you know, long semi starvation diet is that, yeah, you will, you're not as chipper, you know, uh, but there's a, like, I've, I've, yeah, I've had people who like straight up, they've never been depressed before. And that is like legitimately what they're feeling. And, um, usually as soon as I hear that, like, um, I'm all ears and I'm like, all right, how long has this been going on for? Um, how frequently does it happen throughout, say, a week? And um, if this continues much longer, we're just, <laughs> we're done. And often I'm the one that has to pull the plug on the prep. Um, there's the other variation where it's, I just, and people hate to hear this, but I might have to take it a bit easier on the person. You know, maybe instead of getting 100% shredded, we have to get 95% shredded, you know. And it's something that, you know, we, we talk about during. Um, it's like, I'm only going to push you as far as I think is, is okay. Um, you know, it's, it's no different than creating a program for an athlete. You know, it's like, okay, you're kind of hurt, you're limping. I'm not going to throw these loads at you that are just like risque, you know. Um, we're going to play a bit more conservative and maybe things wake up. But yeah, usually it's unable to comply and the, the mood disturbance that far exceeds like what is normal in that situation. Yeah, no, and I guess the most important things that, that athletes can do to put themselves in, in the best position, which which I tried to do, I tried to, to tick all the boxes, you know, from the get-go, you know, make sure I wasn't too overweight, that training was, you know, in a good, good place, um, that, you know, I was keeping my, you know, cardio in from an early point so that I build those habits, um, you know, just the prepping and getting the food ready, all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a little more that goes into it uh, in terms of the the position physically, mentally, the athlete uh, needs to be in as well as their lifestyle before they even start a prep. So what are some things that, that athletes should be doing to, I guess, put themselves in the best position uh, possible so that, you know, the potential mood disturbances, even though a lot of it's out of their control, you know, can be minimized, um, you know, stress can be minimal obviously they're you know just ready to you know knock this thing out of the park see one thing you had set up really well um because you know how it is post prep like the blues are real like they're actually a little worse sometimes even with with the food you know um which is normal whenever any task is complete that's kind of the feeling you get especially if you are a doer you know you're like i'm relieved i'm satisfied but there's something missing now you know um and with you, you had enough things initially. It was like a healthy amount of things going on where I'm like, you know what? Post prep is going to be great. We'll, you know, we'll gain our like, you know, six, seven kilos like in three weeks. He'll be healthy. He'll be good. And then he has all these things he has to take care of, you know, that he's going to get to, you know, put 110% into now. Um, so I think that's a big one. It's kind of keeping a, yeah, like a portfolio of happiness that is diversified, you know, outside of just like the contest prep. Um, but that is pretty automated, just kind of like the contest prep, you know, because that's how you had your thing set up. It was pretty automated. You just check things off the list. You had every you got everything scheduled and ready to go. So that all you have to do is do it basically. Um, and that's how I like it. I like the outside of life things to kind of be similar and like, but be scheduled too, and not like we had some surprises when it came to like your business side of things. And that, that was a big part. It wasn't necessarily that you underestimated the work and what you had outside of the prep. It was more so these things just came out of nowhere and they have to be dealt with. So 
Um, so I think that's a big one. Is like I worry for the college student that you know, <clears throat> hey, they're maybe taking three courses, and other than that, they're just prepping and you know, going on Instagram looking at fitness things. Like that's the person that struggles. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. And and that was something I, I wasn't as worried about uh, post prep um, because yeah, like you said, I, I had the family, I had the business, I had so much to do and I found this with a lot of my athletes it's the ones who you know put their entire life on hold to do a prep and then try to pick up the pieces again they're the ones who usually struggle the most um, you know post prep and yeah I guess uh, something else I wanted to, to chat about was uh, you know obviously I had these curveballs thrown at me uh, which jacked up my stress uh, and fatigue quite a lot um, and it played a big role in my inability to, to keep pushing through the prep um, and being one of the most chilled out bodybuilders I know Birdo uh, you know what advice do you have to competitors to I guess better handle uh, you know stressful periods you know if you've got the college student who's you know got some exams coming up or you know if you've got a coach who's also managing other prep athletes or you know anyone everyone has stressful lives it's all relative but you know how do you handle personally and what advice do you have uh, for those periods where we see a little bit of a spike in uh, stress during a prep? <clears throat> so it's kind of how we do it with, uh, you know, we have a, say, just like the, the standard microcycle for training, or that's that's a task, you know, like even your bro is a bodybuilder, they kind of think of it that way, like this is my body parts, I will structure them in a way to manage fatigue, manage stress. Um, and our diet does the exact same thing at the micro level. We have refeeds, you know, uh, you know, days off in the diet where we're eating enough, but like bigger picture, um, I think a, a contest prep coach that understands that you know everything is connected at the end. You know, there's if you kind of know what things are going to look like, you can have sections where like, okay, it's safe to push here. You know, let's back off a little bit there. And I think sometimes when people think of a contest prep, it's like it's supposed to be a downward spiral of like like your, with your calories and in terms of shittiness. And it's like no, you can bring that thing up, you can bring it down, and, you know, you can take a lot of things into consideration. Like, it's, it's not out of, it's, it doesn't seem that out of the box to think that, hey, if we have a hard training week, let's up calories a little bit this week. Um, but the same, like, I say that, and, you know, most of the bodybuilders, they, they, they'll nod their head to that. But when it comes to, like, hey, we have exams, and then a week of harsh studying before, you know what, let's go ahead and maybe extend the diet break and make it a 12-day thing, things like that. Um, so it should pulsate along with not just your training, but since this it's so different from other sports, you know, it, it goes with you wherever you go. Maybe you should also consider, you know, having especially the diet, uh, having that kind of fluctuate with other things that are going on in life. Yeah, no, I I totally agree, and uh, the we we ran I think it was like two diet breaks, so. If I, if I look back over the structure of, um, you know, my prep and how things went, it was pretty aggressive for a four to six week period, I think it was. Calories were, you know, pretty constant. It was just, you know, the low end of 2,000 with a couple of refeeds. Um, and then we started walking calories back up and then, you know, shit started to hit the fan. So, you know, we, we held it there and took a, you know, an extended diet break. And I guess something I want to talk about uh, in regards to the diet break, which which I didn't find stressful per se, but I definitely know that um, I obviously had never run a full diet break before, um, you know, in, in that kind of condition. Um, you know, I've been in like an off season for three or four years before the emergence of, of diet breaks and their popularity. Um, is Paul's dick all right? Is he, do you need to go check his dick? One more time, the last part. Paul's dick, is, is he all right? Who? Cool. Paul's dick, your dog. Oh, Paul's, oh, you hear Paul, well, yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> I think the UPS guy came in, he's like, is, 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 it, is it here? <laughs> um, so the, for the guys that don't know, my, my, my dog has a very small dick, he was neutered at an early age, and he's, he's, he's forever a puppy, though, so that's, that's the, uh, that's the positive side of things. Um, yeah, so, the diet break. Yeah, the diet break. So, so something I did find a little bit stressful was, um, you know, just the more food, and it brought a bit more food focus. So, although it was supposed mm. to be a time where I was obviously eating more food to, to you know, stress a little bit less, 
uh, because I had more food, I had more options, and uh, I was mm-hmm. definitely feeling the food focus a little bit more than than I should have. And I was pretty aware of it, and I tried to, you know, slap myself out of it, so to speak, and say, just just eat your shit, just eat a little bit more of it, don't think too much about it. But it definitely brought on a bit more food focus. Um, so I guess you know, how does an athlete, you know, potentially manage that? Because not all athletes will experience the same thing, but I think it's pretty common that, you know, when there's more food given, all of a sudden it's like, oh, shit, let's let's get my fitness pal out and see how we can make this thing work. And before you know it, there's, you know, a little bit more stress around what to eat, what foods to include, all that kind of thing. So what advice do you have, you know, when, when bringing the food up, how athletes should deal with that? Because that can be a stressful time as well, um, you know, even though it's meant to alleviate stress. It can bring about more stress, you know, especially if they're not seeing progress, scale weights pinging around a little bit more, all those kind of things. Yeah, I think sometimes having choices is, is what stress. Like that's the cat's only two to a flexible dining template. That people sometimes um, they don't have enough uh, structure set. And like you said, yeah, now when there's more food, hey, you're hungry at this point. Usually by the time the first diet break hits you, you know, you, you like food a little bit more than when you started the diet. Um, and Man, it's kind of like the the whole. I don't even know if this is an actual study, but I hear it referenced like all the time, like through like just like quick little like snippet videos. Uh, and it's like where they had a group of people, you know, they they got to pick out of three chocolates, one chocolate, they taste the chocolate, and then they rate it on a one to ten scale. And then you had this other group of people that had to pick from forty chocolates, right? And then the, so the group of people they got to pick from the bigger batch, they were less satisfied with. Mm-hmm. Um, with their choice. So I think that's what happens sometimes is when you give yourself all these choices, you just, you're, it's, it's, you're trying to quench something that you just cannot quench. So it's probably best to just have as many things standardized as possible and use flexibility when, or, you know, modify and be dynamic when your diet, when life does that to you, when it's like, okay, you know, I'm not at home for the next two days. We're kind of just, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to have to be on our toes a little bit more. Whereas, you know, if it's just a standard week, diet break, it's like, you know what? Maybe you should just have a lot of the stuff you're already having in slightly greater quantities. No choices. That doesn't exhaust you. You know, you, you'll you be more likely to, to – again, it goes back to conserving energy when it, when, because we're, we're, we're not getting enough energy through our diet. So it's, it's important. It's super important. Um, and here we have this thing like – we're all stress eaters at the end when you think about it. I mean, like we train, we eat, so to you know counteract the stress. We're all stress eaters, and here's this week that's supposed to, if anything, help improve those markers, and we're making it worse because you know we're adding all these different variables to it. So, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the catch twenty two. And even I think I'm pretty dynamic as a dieter, but even then, there's some staples and. I'll catch myself if I'm spending way too much time trying to figure out what I'm going to eat for dinner. It's like, broski, you're done. Go have those rice cakes. You're having a whey protein shake. Sit down, eat that, and you're done. You know, nip that in the butt before you know, the monster grows. Yeah, no, that, that's that's really good advice. I think uh, decision fatigue is real. You can exhaust yourself uh, the more decisions you have to make. So it's a good idea to have staples and it's definitely something I learned, um, you know, from, from that prep in my diet break and then was something that, you know, I quickly taught my athletes was, you know, when, when you're having your diet breaks, you know, keep your food the same, maybe adding one to two more new foods. Um, but that's about it. Just increase your quantities, you know, make it easy on yourself. Um, but I guess in April, uh, you know, we had the chat and I said, bro, I was done. Um, and man, it, it hurt, it hurt a lot, um, because I felt like not only was I, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, failing myself, um, you know, letting, letting my athletes down, letting JPS down, most importantly, letting, you know, you and 3DMJ down, um, you know, because like you said, it, it was, you know, a, I guess a, a show and, you know, in the public eye, um, albeit a small one, but it was out there. Um, and I struggled for, for a few weeks. I, I didn't know what to do and how to pick myself up. Even though I had all these other things going on, um, it wasn't the, the satisfaction relief of, cool, I've done this thing now. I can you know just get back to everything else. It was like, fuck, I, I, I didn't get there. Now I've just got to you know sort of pick myself up um, and nobody else is really going to be able to do that for you. 
So, you know, once the decision was made, um, you know, I'll, I, I battled for a couple of weeks, but what advice would you give to, you know, competitors? You gave me some pretty good advice when we, we had our chat, um, you know, if they do decide that, hey, prep's got to, got to stop now. So, I remember there was this one week, there was this one week where, this is how crazy things were. You're like, you know what, I have a chill week, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty relaxed, you know, it's going to be normal-ish is how you described it. And then, like, I remember looking on your Instagram, you're hosting a powerlifting meet. <laughs> I'm like, for a lot of people, this would be, like, the the quarterly event, that, you know, that they're just, you know, they're losing sleep over, and, like, this is this chill week. So, that's how, that's where things were. Um so, and, and, you know, again, like it all kind of goes back to, like, if you're not failing, you're just not trying, mm-hmm. you know? So the, it's kind of similar to, hey, you're going, you went for that rep on the squat. It didn't happen, you know? Hey, kudos to you. You're going for it. And you knew that even without the surprises, that you had a lot on your plate and that it was going to be a challenge, but that was part of the fun. Um, so coming up short to me, it's like, whoa. Okay, we didn't make it, we didn't finish the prep, but at the end, there's, like, lessons learned from that, and, like, that's how you have to take all failures, you know, it's, that's, that's what they are, they're lessons at the end, and I think next time you prep, you know, we'll, we're more likely to complete the prep because of what we learned, and that is something that, again, folks don't realize, is that so many preps end up not being completed. I'd say out of, man, out of uh, 20 athletes that I work with, we'll probably have three that are, like, mm-mm. Um, I'm not, you know, and I like to think we, and these people don't necessarily have the load that you had, you know? Um, so yeah, I knew that initially, especially given how you are, you're like, wow, I got, I left something undone. Um, there was that thing that flipped through Instagram the other day where Ellie, she, uh, we were talking and I'm like, I don't know how this dude finds the time to shave his legs with everything that he has going on. And because that's just the kind of dude you are, you get stuff done. So, um, yeah, in your case, like, I knew that that was going to be a, a huge hit, but at the same time, you had all these other things going on. So I'm like, you know what, he's going to be okay because he's going to be able to tend to that, uh, build momentum via that, and as he gets things done on that, and it'll the, the, the ending of the prep will be justified. So I think for, foremost, when you start a prep, have things on the side going on. So if something goes wrong, hey, you know, you don't have all your eggs in one basket. You have other things that you can go to and kind of lose yourself in that, and whatever, you know, vigor you were attacking the prep with, you can apply it to that now, like 100%. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, because I think uh, in, yeah, we had the powerlifting meet in April, then in June we had the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference, uh, I had all my athletes competing and, and whatnot, um, you know, which which is all, all massively exciting for me, and there were, you know, obviously a lot of family goals that I had to tick off and things like that, so... That was really useful. It was it was a tough patch um, for for a few weeks, maybe a month, um, but then you know I I got back into the groove of things, uh, so so it turned out all right. But um, yeah, the post comp blues, if you haven't competed, is very real, um, and I guess it's something that athletes do deal with, um, whether they get on stage or you know they they fail a prep, so to speak. Um, but outside of just having many things going on, you know, in terms of the training and the diet, um, you know, what should an athlete do? Because I wasn't in stage condition, but I was probably, you know, just sitting below where where my you know body fat settling point uh, range was, and um, you know, training had obviously gone into the toilets, um, you know, not completely, but it was not where it should have been. Um, so, so in that respect, what should athletes be doing post comp, um, you know, to to get themselves back into the off season, you know, being productive in the gym and putting themselves in a position to make another run at it in the near future. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, people jump off like at different points. Um, there's this like phase where it's like pre shredded where I tend to lose the most people. Um, Probably I think once people are shredded, yeah. shredded, they're okay. You know? Yeah. It's like you're doing too deep. You're in too deep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it depends on where you're at, but I think in most cases you are going to need an accelerated, um, like, gaining phase, much like, you know, the, the, the recovery diet that, that we like to use with our athletes. You know, kind of, you're going to have to scale that to, to where you're at. Maybe, you know, you don't need 10% of your body weight back, but, hey, you know, we need 5% ASAP. Um, 
the good thing about the off season is it's a little bit more flexible, it's a little bit more pliable. Um, it's more straightforward, right? Much more room for error because it's so it's so long, right? Um, so you can totally take you know the energy and the focus that you have for that prep and hey, apply it to that off season. And that is one thing that I do find because it's hard to sell people on the importance of the off season. And whenever I've had someone kind of dump off and they've had to do an about phase, turn back the other way, they ha- they 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 find an easier time doing that, you know, because they were able to take you know whatever energy they had for their their bodybuilding they've been able to take that you know what wasn't enough for a prep but is enough for a for a mouse season they're able to transplant that there and thrive and and see that oh there is a point to this and you can go pretty hard in the off season and you know it's a pretty interesting challenge in itself um so yeah the about face how we come out with calories and whatnot depends on how screwed up a person is um you know, with you, you were lean enough where it's like, okay, we probably need a good month of kind of cruiser everything. Let's let's it, let's eat in at an intake that's gonna basically let us get a little bit fatter every week. But we weren't in that deep of a hole. Um, but yeah, yeah, take uh, take that focus and apply it to the off season because in reality, that is that that's why you were so excited because you had a great off season. That's where the show is won at the end. Yeah, for sure. And I think something that definitely helped me was. Uh putting the focus back on, you know, a couple of big lifts in the gym and, and trying to get stronger. And I actually signed up for a powerlifting meet in July because I'm like, fuck it, I've got to compete in something. Um, didn't tell anyone about it. I'm like, I'm not going to tell a soul. I'm just going to do this thing. I rock up on the day and everyone's going to be like, what the fuck? And I was like, you know, prepping myself for it. And then, you know, Siobhan sat me down. She's like, Jacob, why are you competing? And I'm like, because I feel like I need to. And she's like, you don't actually want to. Why don't you pull out? plan it ahead, you know, get a coach, do it properly, do it the right way, like you always do things. Um, and fortunately, she's, she's, she was a lot wiser than I was uh, in that moment, so I, so I followed her advice. Um, but it was a good focus because all of a sudden I was worrying about numbers on the, on the bar, you know, in the gym, not on the scale and, you know, how I was looking in the mirror, which I think uh, was really useful. But, uh, Berto, it was... Uh, a very disappointing way to, um, you know, I guess, work together and uh, finish things. But I, I did learn a hell of a lot. Like I told you that, you know, there were so many things that, um, you know, I got out of the prep, even though we didn't get there in the end. Um, and I'll be back knocking on your door in the near future to uh, to help get me there. So, man, thank you very much for obviously helping me out with the prep and uh, coming on today to talk to everyone about, uh, you know, how to go about things when you know, it, it gets tough and the, I guess, unspoken side of bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah, no, and if anything, one thing that I was like, I hope he understands this and I hope he sees this, that my respect for you only grew after that because I was not there for all the stuff you were going through, but, you know, you told me enough for me to be like, wow, like this dude is, he's, he's legit because I knew you would have put it down the prep. I knew you would have given me like everything you had like for the cause. Um, so to make that decision, especially for someone who is willing to do that, you probably could have tried to keep going, but it would have affected the bottom line, you know, and we're not about that. We want to put out a sensational product. So, so no, man, I look forward to that next one. And again, it's always very flattering for me when a high profile person comes to me, someone who knows your stuff, I'm like, whoa, okay, you're doing something well. So I look forward to it, man. And I'll remember that, man. You better not prep with anyone else. No, I won't be. Don't worry about that. I'm loyal to 3DMJ with with the uh, with the bodybuilding bro. No, thank you. It's uh, been a pleasure, Berto. Where can the listeners find you on the gram and websites, all that kind of jazz? Yeah, so uh, 3DMuscleJourney.com. That is the website. We have uh, all sorts of good content. There's a little bit of everything. We have the 3D Muscle Journey Vault, which is some courses. We're starting to to get on that tip a little bit. Um, Personally, I frequent the Instagrams the most. It's the platform that's most friendly to me, and I'm able to, whatever I have an idea, I just spit it out, and that's super convenient. Um, so you all can find me there, and um, I try to keep you guys informed when it comes to something new that I might feel most people need. You know, it's like, oh, this is a great idea. Let's throw it out there. Or even like my own training, and like my own, I'm trying to be better about like showing the good side and the bad side of things because I've been guilty of only showing the highlights. So, and as we discussed here, it's not about that. But that's what makes the victory sweeter is those low points, right? Hundred percent. But uh, thank you very much for your time, man, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, feel free to like it, share it, 
and get the good word out there. Thank you. Awesome, man.